First thing that comes to mind when I think of God's holiness is to be in awe, to be awestruck. Um, that's what I think about when I think of God being holy. I also think about God requiring us to be holy and how in comparison it feels unattainable, but it is the standard, um, and yeah, just the fullness of him, and like, to not be worthy to be in his presence, the holiness is what makes him. I think there was, there was a moment when I felt like idolatry was something that was really clear. Like, you worship another god, or like you're after material possessions, or, you know, you're just a slave to a specific sin. Um, but I think after coming back to the faith fully, um, and like testing my faith for it to be sure, I realized like there's a way in which self-righteousness kind of creeped in as an idol in a weird way. So it's not as much these external things, but like it flows from our hearts, like our idols flow from our hearts. What causes wars against us, right? Like it's from within, you know? So I think it's taken on a much more personal, daily struggle versus like something that you look at other people and say like oh you have an idol or like where we can all be idols to ourselves and so the answer to how like we can work actively against idolatry is to believe the word and I know that can seem cliche to some but again going back to that space of knowing like I didn't make myself come here. Like, this is something that has existed before me. Um, There's so many ways in which encounters with God have proven his truth. And if I can't believe the word, I am I'm all sinking sand. I'm gonna reach for everything uh, within my own mind or things that are external to leech onto and that reads room for idolatry, right? It might not be a golden calf or like, you know, these things that are really clear, but yeah, we, it's like slowly planting that seed for us to feel like we have another answer. Even if some people are comfortable saying that answer is, I don't know. Welcome again. How are you? Ooh, you sound sleepy. Jesus. If I could sing Greatest Thy Faithfulness, I would to wake you up. Can't you and sing? Hey, did y'all hear the girl? I said, come on here solo. It's the solo for me. Anywho, um, who was here last night? Bunch of y'all. Who just showed up? Hey, six of you. We're glad to see all six of you. Uh, I know it's early in the morning, uh, but we just, we want y'all to still have your day back. And so we done by 12, 12, 15, 12, 20, you know, depending on how the Holy Ghost move. Uh, I don't know, but don't use that as an excuse to just be running over time all the time either. Uh, but anywho. <laughs> 
before I start, I just wanted to kind of, this has nothing to do with anything. It's just that I've been watching this documentary on 9-11 uh, all week. Ooh, my earring came off. I don't, I don't really care. Um, anywho, I've been watching this documentary on 9-11 because I'm really, I just really like documentaries. And so the na nat, uh, National Geographic has this new one that's on Hulu. Um, I don't remember the name, so don't ask me. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one of the best 9-11 documentaries I've ever seen because they have all of this unseen footage and these different perspectives and all these things. And uh, you know when you're watching something and you feel real spiritual where it's like they tell a story and it's like, ooh, that's a word. I just got to share the word even if it ain't got nothing to do with what I'm going to say. Okay, so this man, he's, uh, he was a firefighter, and he was in one of the towers that had not fallen. So the first tower had fallen, and they were, you know, and the tower was going up trying to rescue all the people. So he said, uh, when the other first tower fell, we figured, okay, this second one is about to fall, so we need to get out. And so they were on floor 20, you know, uh, uh, the Trade Center had 106 floors, I believe. And so they were on their way down with all of the firefighters and they stopped because um, they saw this lady who was in the doorway and she was crying and she was just tired and exhausted because she was a 60 year old woman who had walked uh, from floor 73 to 420 and, and she didn't want to go anymore. And so they like, you, you finna come with us. And so she follows all of these firefighters down the different flights of stairs and all these things. So they reach floor number four and Susan, I don't think that's her name, but we just gonna say that. Susan, she gave me Susan vibes. Susan, <laughs> obviously the story ends good. That's why I'm, I'm making jokes. Uh, <laughs> Susan stops at floor number four and says, I can't go no more. You, you hear the word coming? I, I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't go no more, y'all just leave me. And so the firefighter, he a little perturbed, he like, come on now, lady. The other one done fail, we gots to go. Do, do you wanna live or no? And so in the meantime, while they are trying to convince her to move along and keep going, the, the tower begins to fall. And they said, as it's falling, they said it, it took about eight seconds to fall. As it's falling, they hear the boom from the floors hitting other floors. And he was like, it was like boom, 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 boom. So they're just waiting to die. Then they realize they're silent. And he said, when everything collapsed, we realized that we were in the only part of the building where if you were there, you would stay alive. He said, if, if we would have made it to the lobby, we would have died. If, if we would have got outside right on the, you know, in the parking lot, we, we would have died, but somehow where she stopped. <laughs> the word for me was, sometimes in life, what you think is an inconvenience is actually your deliverance. Yeah. They like, we got to keep going, not realizing that the providence of God had tired her body in such a way that it saved their life. My God, ain't got nothing to do with what I'm going to say next, but I just had to get that out. Said, I don't even think he know he preaching. He don't even know that's a word. Anywho, today we we finna talk about idolatry. Pivot. <laughs> and I, I want to begin this session with a modern hymn about love. Some of you might recognize it. Some of you might not. Either way, just follow me. Here's one of the verses. It starts with, baby, I love you. You are my life. I'm going to preach this thing. My happiest moments weren't complete if you weren't by my side. You're my relation and connection to the sun. You next to me, there's no darkness I can't overcome. You are my raindrops. I am the sea. 
You and God, who's my sunlight, I'm blooming, grown so beautifully. <laughs> Baby, I'm so proud, proud to be your girl. You make the confusion go all the way from this cold and misty where she thought she was right. Here's the hook. I am in love with you. You set me free. Finish it. I'll never leave. Just keep loving me the way I love you loving me. Some of us in the room have no idea what's going on. I, I don't know this, this hymn. They never sang this in my Presbyterian church. This was never in the hymnal. <laughs> um, for those of us in the room who are confused, this song was written by a prophetess. She got a real big church, it's bigger than Joel Osteen, I promise. Uh, her name is, is, is Prophetess Beyonce Knowles Carter. And <laughs> when the song came out, I loved it. It was a jam, it was a vibe. I, I played it on my little CD player all the time. Every single day, till I got saved in my right mind. I was in the car one time and it was on the radio. And, and she, what she said, she said, I am in love with you. You set me free. I can't do this thing called life without you here with me. I said, wait, <laughs> this is idolatry. Like, she done made a whole worship song to Jay-Z. I, I just, where in the world is he a savior? He doesn't look like Jesus. Can't, he can't, he can't. <laughs> Imagine if Jesus looked like Jay-Z, I would be so confused. I had really high expectations, Lord. I don't know, I just, I just didn't think, I don't, maybe that's why they didn't believe you, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the thing is, <laughs> I'm all for, I got so many more ignorant things to say, and it's just, I'm all for a woman <laughs> expressing her love for a man. I'm not for a woman putting their ultimate hope in a man, okay? So I just use that as an example, as a, as a framework. Uh, this, this morning, we're not going to talk about relationships we're not going to talk about prophetess Bay and deaconess or deacon Jay-Z. Um, we're going to deal with the subject of idolatry. And this is why. Because in, in having any conversation about holiness, to talk about holiness is to talk about God. When you get to the, the root or the definition of what an idol is, we are dealing with things, subject, people, objects, that we are expecting to be God for us. And so there is something inside of our expectation that also wants our idols to be holy to us, to be good, to be faithful, to be wise, to be constant. And so I think in talking about the unholiness of idolatry, we can also reaffirm how God is God for us and to us but how our idols will always fail us because they are insufficient at being God to us. Does that make sense? Tim Keller defined idolatry as anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. I like this definition because we tend to deceive ourselves into thinking that idolatry is just bowing down to statues and, and, and putting little oranges under the Buddha. We, we think that that's just idolatry, that, that it's you, you, you bent your body toward the thing and worshiped it. But truly, I, idolatry is just giving anything your functional trust. 
I also got that phrasing from Tim Keller, and I use it because it removes the lies that we tell ourselves. We, we love to think that we, we love and trust God with our whole heart and our whole mind and our whole soul, but do we really? Because if you, if you took a survey of what you think about, where you go to cope, who, who you call for peace, how you spend your money, what makes you unrighteously angry, there you will find who or what it is you really trust. So this, this conversation may pick at some things and, and reveal some things, but let it. That's good news. Because God wants to reveal your idols so you can make room for him. So don't resist the conviction. Don't, don't resist that. We, we want to be free people. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for your spirit's power. That he would dig deep into us. That he would show us our idols, he, he would show us what we, we look to more than you. God, that you would make it abundantly obvious, even if it isn't something I address, God, that by the power of your spirit, you would bring it to mind. And, and I pray for our, the reaction we, we, we typically have to conviction where we try to suppress righteousness by lying to ourselves and saying, no, but I pray. No, but I read the Bible. No, but I go to church. God, give us no room for excuses here. Deliver us from evil, all the various ways in which it manifests in our heart so that we can fill ourselves and be filled with the fullness of God as Paul pr prayed in Ephesians 3. Lord, I pray, God, that we would have the strength to comprehend you, how deep and how long and how wide and how high your love is for us and we can pray this with full confidence because you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ever ask or think according to the power that works in us and so I pray God that you would move in Jesus name amen turn a click in your Bibles to Exodus 32 they already got it on the screen Starting at verse 1, it says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up. That's rude. You're going to say please or something. Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know where he is. That's J.H.P. Birch. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded him. They, they have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation out of you. Skip to verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides. On the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God. 
And the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. I wonder how fake gods taste. So what had happened was 15 days or 50 days after Israel was delivered out of Egypt, God descended on Mount Sinai to speak audibly with his people, giving them his law and making covenant with them. At some point, God tells Moses to come up to the mountain so he can write his law on tablets to give to Moses to deliver to the people. So when we reach Exodus 32, Moses is up there with God. He's, He's been on this mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights waiting on these fancy, special, God-written tablets. Say amen if you're catching where we are. So where we are now in the story is, is most likely immediately after the 40 days is up. The chapter opens up with a fascinating insight about what is happening in the mind of the people as they wait on Moses to come down from the mountain. Verse 1 says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves to Aaron and said to him, get up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. It is unclear if anybody told the people of Israel how long Moses would be away But what is clear is that they have grown impatient and they have no desire to wait any longer. So as a cure for their impatience, to to cope with what they don't like is happening, they come up with a brilliant idea, so they think, which is to make another God, which gives me a small caveat. Isn't it interesting how quickly impatience can lead to idolatry? We, we get tired of waiting on the husband, so we sleep with the boyfriend. We get tired of waiting on joy to come in the morning, so we drink a whole bottle or eat a couple edibles instead. We get tired of waiting on the world to come, so we just become worldly instead. The, the Bible is true when it says you have need of endurance. Your impatience will lead you to make fake gods as a reason to cope. Anywho, the people, they aren't here to endure. They, they want to move this journey along. So they go to Aaron, who is Moses' brother and the leader in charge, and they demand him to make them gods that will go before them. Which brings me to my first point about the unholiness of idols. Idols are unlike God and therefore unholy because, number one, idols are limited. If Israel was paying attention at all, this would have been plain when they used the words make and gods in the same sentence. And any god that is created is no god at all. Because think about this, if your god was made, then your god is therefore dependent and needed. It needed you to become a god, and it needs your worship to maintain the perception of it being a god. A needy God isn't self-sufficient, therefore it is always limited in its ability to give you what you actually need. Anybody in a relationship understands this? And if they don't, they, they will soon. Romantic comedies and Disney movies, a couple of the Tyler Perry ones with the bad wigs. So how you got all this money and you keep buying these bad wigs? It's terrible. Distracting, actually. (laughs) But 
they, they train us to believe that either men in general or a special man in particular will come along, we will fall in love, he will rescue us from ourselves, filling every need, satisfying every void, and, and ultimately make us happy and whole, and, and that's a, a lie from the pit of hell. And, and this is why every man is a creature created by God, therefore every man is insufficient to be God. Every man is just as dependent and just as needy as you are, needy for love and needy for affection and needy for hope and needy for salvation. They aren't strong enough to be your main source of strength. They, they don't have the power to heal your every wound or deliver you from pain. And we know this, don't we? We know men are limited. Do you know why a man has to ask you what's wrong? You ever thought about it? It's because he doesn't know, sis. He's not omnipresent. He, he don't even know when his phone bill is due. Why he gonna know why you got an attitude at 2.45 on a Thursday night? Know all the stats, but just can't seem to find out when to pay your phone bill. You feel some, some angst coming out, don't you? Preston knows what I feel, so I ain't confessing nothing to you that I ain't told him. I don't understand how you know everything Jordan did, but you can't seem to remember to put the milk back in the fridge. That, 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 I just can't understand what's missing. Because men are limited by their humanity. This will set you free when you get married. They're, they're creaturely existent. They, they are insufficient and therefore they are an unholy God if ever we decided to make them one. Just like any idol. The, the beauty about God being God is that because he's transcendent, remember, God isn't created. And because God isn't created, he has no needs. Listen to Acts 17, 25. Paul speaking, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind, life and breath and everything. What Paul is saying is that it would be foolish to ever think that the creator of everything needs the creation for anything. He, he doesn't need them to create somewhere for him to live as if he could be contained in the building. He, he didn't make the world. He didn't make man. He, he didn't make you because he needed you as if there was something lacking in God. As if God wasn't happy and whole within himself. It is, it is because God is completely sufficient within himself that when he makes, it isn't to fill a void, but it's to create an opportunity for all that he is to be known and loved by another. God didn't create you out of need, but out of generosity. I must add that God doesn't need anyone to worship him either as if he was a narcissist with a deficient view of himself, depending on the praise of people to boost his self-esteem. God doesn't need your praise. He deserves it. And you should be thankful. He is the one that gives everyone everything. Life and breath. Food and faithfulness. Body and soul. And he is able to serve you in that way because in him is no lack. A God with no needs is a God who is able to supply everyone else's. Unlike a calf made of gold. After Israel G-checks Aaron into making them a so-called God, this is what happened next. Look at verse 2. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. 
So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What is so disheartening about this scene is when you remember how they got the gold in the first place. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus 3. I want you to see it. Exodus 3. Verse 21. This is God speaking. He says, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. The gold jewelry that Aaron uses to make the calf is most likely the same gold jewelry Israel acquired from the Egyptians on their way out of Egypt. But notice The reason they were given the gold in the first place is because God didn't want them to leave slavery empty-handed. So he gave them favor so that when they asked the Egyptians to give, they did. God allowed them to plunder the Egyptians because he was kind. He was providing for them. He was giving them back some of the excesses that the Egyptians had earned on the backs of the oppressed people of Israel repairing the theft. That's a a word for today, if you caught it. And now, at the bottom of the mountain, where God has revealed himself and, and made covenant with his people, they are taking God's gifts, taking what God has given them out of his kindness and making an idol out of it because they don't believe that the God that gave them the gift is good enough to wait for. Ain't that a word? (laughs) That most, if not all, of your idols are gifts that God has given to you for his glory. Most, if not all, of your idols are things that God has given to you out of his benevolence, your marriage. Your job, food, your home, your body, your intellect, all of it is a gift that we make of God. But let's keep going. I think it's helpful to know why Aaron made a calf and not a chicken or a fish. You ever ask yourself that? It is most likely a cultural adaptation of what they absorbed in Egypt. In Egyptian culture, one of their most popular idols was a calf slash bull by the name of Apis. Apis was a physical representation of a deity by the name of Ptah. Ptah, in Egyptian thinking, was the deity responsible for creation. Apis, the bull, was Ptah incarnated. So that by worshiping the calf, they believed they were worshiping who the calf represented. So what is probably happening in Exodus 32 is that Aaron ain't been out of Egypt that long. The festivals and the shrines and the images of Apis are still in his mind. So much so that when Israel asks him to make a god, he looks to Egypt for what, for inspiration on what kind of animal he should choose to be a physical representation of Yahweh. Not surprisingly, he chooses the idol that would have been highly familiar to Israel, one they would have recognized, one they would have been inclined to worship, one that was supremely venerated in Egypt. So then please expect that your idols are idols that your culture most likely esteems most. Coming back to the story, Aaron takes the gold, makes the calf, and then they have a worship service. Jordan ain't there though. And they say, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Again, we have Israel using words that should have alerted them to their delusion. The calf ain't been here but five seconds. And now all of a sudden, they saying he's the one that saved them. What they failed to see is that a a golden calf, no matter how beautiful it might be, it is unholy, 
unlike God because point number two is idols are always local. Idols are unlike God since they are all restrained by space and time because God is transcendent, unique, existing ontologically different. I just like that word. That's why I say it, but it means being. Thank you, Lynn. Which I'm saying, his being is different from us. He is not limited nor controlled by space and time because he created it. Time is a creature. So God's relationship to time is that of a sovereign, not a servant. Follow me. So praising an idol that was just born for an act he wasn't around for is ridiculous. But remember the expectation they put on the calf before they made it. They wanted a God that would go before them. Meaning, they wanted a God that would lead them. They wanted a God that would protect them. They wanted a God that would guide them. And those expectations are actually a morally acceptable need. In one sense, they are acknowledging their inability to guide themselves in the wilderness and to protect themselves from danger, which is to say that it's never a sinful thing to be needy because all creatures have needs. It becomes sinful when we rebel against God to get the need met, especially when you consider that God has revealed himself to be the primary source of their satisfaction. Israel had proof after Israel left Egypt the way God decided to lead them, to go before them in the wilderness, was in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Israel had proof that God was able to lead his people. They had proof that God was able to go before them. And because God is transcendent, existing differently than us and therefore not restrained in anything in heaven or on earth and how he shows up. Catch this. He was able to reveal himself in the daytime in a pillar of cloud and at night in a pillar of fire showing Israel how flexible he was in his leadership so as to manifest himself in the ways that they needed. Oh my God. That golden calf couldn't do nothing but be itself. They wanted it to go before them, but it couldn't even move without their help. Going with them instead of ahead of them. That calf couldn't even tell them what was on the way because it didn't know the beginning and the end. And a God that can't warn you is a God that can't protect you from what's coming. As for the Ancient of Days, before time he was. After time he will be. So whether it's 17, 19, or 2021, 20, God is always able to go before you. And since idols have no choice but to submit to space and time, if your idol is located in, in a particular city, in a particular country, in a particular job, in a particular tax bracket, in, in a particular political party, then if ever you are too far from its reach because you moved or lost your job or your preferred president, or the liquor store isn't open, or old boy won't pick up his phone, then it's at that point that you realize that a localized idol is one you won't always have access to, therefore your hope is inconsistent. Our needs are constant. They follow us everywhere. So imagine trusting in a wannabe God that can't even meet you where you are. It is futile to place your hope in anything that will inevitably leave you and forsake you. But with God, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be on Mars or in Montana or in D.C. or in Virginia. You can land there and God going to be there. After the Israel lights, have a little worship service. For the golden calf, something insightful happens between God and Moses. Moses is, is up there with God, minding his holy business. <laughs> We're waiting on God to write on these tablets. I just, I would love to see that. Is he, is he left-handed? Is he ambidextrous? I don't know. He's God. 
Yeah, you can ride with his toe and it's going to be perfect. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> if it was 2021, though, Moses might have found out what was happening on the, among the people through a text message. But because he's also a creature, therefore he's also limited. There's all, therefore he's also local. He can only be where he is and know where he knows. He wasn't able to be in two places at one time. But God, who is with him, tells him what is happening below them. The Lord says to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They, they turn aside and made themselves idols. They, they have made a golden calf and, and worshipped it. They've said that these are your gods, O Israel, who you brought up out of Egypt. At the same time that God is dealing with Moses, he is completely aware of everything that is happening among the people down to the very words they have spoken. Meanwhile, they are putting their faith in an idol and a calf to lead them when it can't even see nothing. The golden calf might have had ears on the side of its face, a mouth right above its jaw. It might even had a, a rounded skull to simulate the presence of a brain. But even with all the outward symbols of a living being, the golden calf was as dead as a goat. We've learned that idols are limited. We've learned that idols are local. And my third point is that idols are lifeless, which seems obvious. Aaron literally took a bunch of earrings and earring backs. <laughs> That's probably why I stayed together, you know. You got the little rubber in there. That thing had to stink, my God. <laughs> they in the wilderness, little sweaty earring backs. I'm sorry. <laughs> he took a bunch of earrings and earring backs, I'm gonna stand on that point, and, and he made a gold animal. Not a god, but an inanimate object, which might remind you of Genesis 1 and 2. When God took dirt and made man out of it. The process of creating the calf and Adam is similar, except that once God was finished with making man, having life within himself, he breathed into Adam's nostril and he became what? A living being. But with his idol, however, he had eyes but could not see. Ears but could not hear, hands but could not feel. Aaron and Israel, no matter how much they worshiped this calf, they had no power within themselves to make this golden calf a real being, let alone a real God. Therefore, if your idol is a real person, then you need to understand that your idol is not the source of life. Everything that they have to give you is borrowed. Everything they have to offer you is most likely a gift from God's hand. So if ever you worship a man or a woman for love or comfort or provision or peace, do know that they were merely a conduit of God's grace towards you. So when you gave them your worship, that means you gave your worship away to the, same, or the wrong person. Oh, I'm tired. If you're idle, say your idol isn't a person but an object, a phone, a social media network, a bank account a bottle of wine, whatever it is that you are trusting for identity, for security, for peace, it means you are trusting in a dead thing to resurrect you. Anytime we refuse to trust God as the ultimate source and satisfier of our needs, we are opening ourselves up to deception. And the scary thing is that once it happens, once you conclude that God isn't trustworthy in some area of your life, you will find something else that you believe is. And you will eventually become a person that is grossly dependent on idols as a way to make it through life and you will have no idea. If we lack self-awareness and sensitivity to the spirit, we will miss it every day. Just like us at times, Israel was blind to how lifeless their idol really was. 
And because of that, they trusted the golden calf to go before them. And, and they praised it for delivering them out of Egypt. But this is the thing. Because an idol has no life within itself, it is an insufficient savior. What I want us to understand is that the difference between idols and God is this. Because an idol, hear me, has no life within itself, it cannot save you or serve you. God who is life and gives life is the only one capable of satisfying all of your needs. One, because since God is alive, he is actually aware of them. Remember, God's salvation of Israel was preceded by God's awareness of their needs. He said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. I, I know their sufferings. I have come down. All of these verbs is contrasted with idols who cannot see cannot hear, cannot smell, a God with no life cannot notice you in your room listening to the suffering in your back and comprehend it as pain. An idol can't speak, an idol can't rebuke or comfort when the time calls for it. And if your idols are mere people, we thank God for community, but they may see and speak to the issues of your heart, but what they say and what they see will always be narrowed after as compared to God who doesn't have to call you to know how you are. As the fountain of living waters, God presents himself as being the only real, true fulfiller of our continual needs and contrast to idols which are consistently categorized in the scriptures as unprofitable or useless. Whatever we trust or whenever we trust anything other than God to save us from all of our fears, all of our doubts, all of our anxieties satisfy our deepest longings, provide our every need. We have trusted in an unholy God to be what it cannot be. If you are trusting a God for salvation, they have no power. If resurrection, they have no life. If peace, they don't even have the sovereign control over today's circumstances to help you even endure them. If compassion, they don't have the eyes to see or, or the ears to hear or the, or the mouth to speak. Therefore, they lack the personhood needed to meet you where you are and to take you where you need to go. But if we redirect our faith onto the true and living God, we will find in him everything we need. If salvation, he is mighty to save. If resurrection, he is the resurrection and the life. If peace, he is the prince of peace. If compassion, he is the Lord, the Lord, a gracious and compassionate with God, with him. We have all that the mind needs for wisdom, all that the heart needs for love, all that the body needs for satisfaction, all that the affections need for joy. I'm not making this up, it's in the Bible. And since the scriptures declared that we were not only made by him, but for him, it should be no surprise that we will never be whole within ourselves without him. We need God, saints and angels. More than that, if everything good exists because of God, then there is nothing that exists that is better than God. When Moses came down the mountain, if you remember, he was grieved by what he saw. The people were having a really good time worshiping a dead thing. Which is to say, this isn't in my notes, but to even be grieved by our culture's idols says something about the miracle that God has done within us. Because so many of us are actually ignorant to the worship happening around us. But in verse 19, it says that he came near the camp. He saw the calf and the dancing. They were excited. Moses got mad, took the tablets that God just wrote on, ground it up, burned it, and made it into garlic powder, put it on the water. You know, garlic powder going on everything, and made the people of <laughs> made the people of Israel drink it. And if I were to put myself in the shoes of the Israelites, seeing Moses destroy the golden calf, 
might have brought a level of grief. Because I might have said to myself, I've invested so much into this thing you are destroying. And I did it because I was scared. In their unbelief, they might have really believed that God was no longer with them. And this isn't to downplay their sin, but it is to examine their humanity and, and how much it hurts to either lose or be called to destroy an idol of your own making. Because again, if you don't trust God to be what you need, then the thought of destroying the one thing you do trust is terrifying. You might say, if I give up the idol of marriage, what will I do if I am single for the rest of my life? If I give up the idol of being successful in this industry, of being a popular praise and worship leader, of being a great Bible teacher, what will I do if I am not successful? What will that say about my own identity? If you have to give up the idol of intoxicants because they kept you sane and they've given you comfort and providing you a false sense of peace, you will say, what will I do if I don't have these, these, this liquor and these edibles and these things to consume and consume? What will I do when I feel the emptiness within my soul? It feels unsafe. It feels unsafe. I remember feeling that way when God was calling me to leave my girlfriend so that I could serve him with my whole heart. I wasn't scared to surrender just because of my sin. That's, that's a big part of it. But I was scared to surrender because it felt like God was calling me to let go of everything that I thought gave me life. Everything that I thought gave me peace. But do you know why God was doing it? Because God loved me too much to let me go through life trusting in broken cisterns when he was the only one that could quench my thirst. God calls you to surrender out of his kindness because he knows nothing else will work but him. So in my repentance, I had to redirect my faith onto the true and living God. And I had to believe that once I let everything go, once my hands were empty, that he was big enough to fill them up again. And not with stuff, not with ministry, but with himself. That God needed my hands to be open so that I can know the one I was made for. Do you hear what I'm saying? Like the golden calf, your idols can be destroyed. And that is good news. It don't sound like it. And one reason is that if your idol can be destroyed, it proves that your idol isn't a real God in the first place. The second reason that is good news is that if, because your idol can be destroyed, it means that you can be delivered from the thing you thought would deliver you. There's this interesting story in John chapter 2. I'm about to close. When Jesus goes into the temple, makes a whip, drives out the money changers and the other folks that were turning God's house into a place of commerce instead of worship. And the people ask Jesus what sign that he, what sign will he give them for this behavior? What, what, on what basis does he have the right to cleanse the temple in this way? And you have to remember that Jesus is cleansing, cleansing the temple because the people were supposed to be there to be worshiping God, but they were worshiping money. They were worshiping an idol under the guise of religious faithfulness. <laughs> and they couldn't see it or him. Their idolatry blinded them to the reality of their spiritual state and the God who just interrupted it. So Jesus tells them something that they don't understand. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. They felt that word. And the people misinterpreted that. They thought he meant he would destroy the building, the actual temple. Even the disciples didn't know what he was talking about. They was always a, delayed until the resurrection. <laughs> and, and if they would have had eyes to see and ears to hear, 
Jesus was giving them a glimpse of the future. When the people would get tired of them, of him touching their idols, when they would get sick of his attempt to deconstruct their false reality, so much so that instead of destroying their idols, they wanted to destroy him. Because remember, when you believe that an idol gives you life, you will try to kill whatever it is that gets in the way, including God. So Israel devised a plan to get rid of Jesus. They might have hoped that if we could just get him out the way, we could just worship whoever and however we want. So they lied on him, and they beat him, and they, they pierced his feet and his hands, and they, they hung him high, and they stretched him wide, and when he hung his head, he died. And they might have thought that they won. That because Jesus was dead, they were finally free. But even before they did any of that, Jesus had already told them what would happen. Jesus had said, you can destroy this body. But guess what? In three days, I will raise it up. I just wanted you to know that you cannot destroy God. He is not a calf. Hello. He is not a calf made of gold. He is not a man made of dust. They might have thought that when they laid his body in the tomb that their idols had the victory. But because Jesus has life within himself, they're, they're unho unlike their unholy gods, after three days he got up. That is why the saints can say, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, and one day God is coming back. Glorious day. That's all I got. That's as much hoop as you're going to get out of me. Appreciate you. <laughs> it is good news that your idols can be destroyed. And it is good news that your God is indestructible. So I don't know what God showed you this, this hour. It will never profit you to trust anything more than God. It's easy. It's easy. It's convenient. It's quick. You have access to it whenever you want, or so you think. But it will always fail you. And when you stand before God, your idols will not be a sufficient mediator for you either. But God, Jesus, he is the one we all need. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your grace. I pray that you would give us the courage to lay aside our idols, that you would give us the faith to embrace the hardship that comes with relinquishing things that have meant so much to us. But I pray, God, that we would also receive the blessing that comes with that, that we would have a clean conscience, that we would, we would have a fruitful life and ministry, that we would have that peace that surpasses our understanding that we would experience what it's like to be free consistently. We pray either, even for our friendships that we would have people in our lives that notice our idols and say something about it. That we would be within churches that preach the whole counsel of God so that we have context for why and who we should trust in more. I thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen.